Good morning. God is good all the time. Amen. Hey, if you want to uh, grab a Bible and turn to Isaiah chapter 9, it's on page 387 of the Bible right by your feet. If you didn't bring one, you'd like to turn there, we'd love for you to do that. There's a pen and a highlighter in the chair back in front of you. You can make some marks in that Bible. Somebody will read those later and um, just to see what mattered to you might matter to them. Anyway, so if you want to use that, it's on page 387, Isaiah chapter 9. Uh, good to see you this morning. Thanks for joining us at Grace. And if you are um, uh, our guest this morning, we're glad that you're with us. If you came to watch grandkids or, or family members sing, thanks for coming. And if you just happen to show up today, uh, welcome to Grace this morning. We're glad that you're here. You're not here by accident, but by appointment. And um, I'm going to uh, uh, get into the Word in just a minute. But uh, before I do that, I just want to pray um, I want to pray for Gail Bontz. Um, she went through a she went through a, a surgery several weeks ago and had some uh, great praise reports of something that was going on in her intestines and and um, that was a, a huge answer to prayer. But she also has um, some chronic issues with her lungs. And um, Brian just let us know a few minutes ago he's probably going to take her into the hospital here. She's not breathing very good this morning. So, Father, we pray for Gail. We come together just as a congregation and as a body of believers. We know there's many who are struggling with sickness and illness, but, Lord, we specifically want to pray for Gail right now. Lord, I pray, God, for a miracle in her lungs. God, I pray, God, that you would enlarge the capacity of her lungs, God. I pray that she'd begin to have the normal oxygen flow, God. This, this battle she's had this last year with her lungs, God, I pray that healing and freedom would come. I thank you for great wisdom for doctors, but we just ask you, Lord, for supernatural intervention this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I started last week uh, in this series talking about a messenger, a mandate, and a messiah. We're going to talk about a mandate today. You know, when somebody makes an announcement like the one I just did, uh, that can cause a little concern sometimes when you hear an announcement. Sometimes when you hear an announcement, it can bring joy. Sometimes it brings sorrow. I mean, I know where I was standing the, uh, um, it was a uh, December, I think it was December or late November, early December morning or afternoon. It was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Girls basketball practice about to start. I was in Amherst at the gym when it was announced that Coach Tom Osborne was retiring as our football coach. I know where I was at. It was great sorrow. It was a day of sorrow. And, um, you know, I also know where I was at just a few weeks later. When uh, Nebraska had beaten Tennessee and Peyton Manning in the Fiesta Bowl, and Scott Frost made this big plea, and a few hours later it was announced that we were national champions. That was great joy. Yeah. You know, right, Brian? Yeah, announcement could be sorrow or joy. You know, I, I, uh, I remember where I was. I was back there in the offices the day that somebody said, hey, turn the TV on. And we had this TV on a cart, and we wheeled it in, and got some channel to come on. And we saw these images, and they, they told, talked to us about how the Twin Towers were falling. You know where you're at when that happened, right? And uh, the concern that that brought. That was an announcement that came. There was another announcement that came uh, from my wife uh, uh, years ago when she announced to me, that she was pregnant and we were going to have a child. That was great joy. I, I don't know what some of you guys, the announcement was for you, but for me it was great joy. <laughs> I've been on the receiving end of that announcement four times in my life. It's, it's a great, joyful thing. And, um, you know, so uh, I want to read out of Isaiah chapter 9 this announcement that was being made prophetically years and years and years before Jesus came. And it was a messianic announcement. It was a prophecy about the Messiah. And there's a portion of the scripture that we, we uh, definitely look at as messianic. But I read this last week. I'm going to start in verse 2 where this really starts. And it says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. You have enlarged the nation and increased its joy. Say joy. The people have rejoiced before you as they rejoice at harvest time and as they rejoice when dividing spoils. For you have shattered their oppressive yoke and the rod on their shoulders, the staff of their oppressor, just as you did on the day of Midian. For every trampling boot of battle and the bloody garments of war will be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father. 
Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast, and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. Last week we talked about verse 2 of this messianic promise where it talks about this great light was coming into the land, into that it was dawning on those who had been living in darkness. And we talked about how Jesus came as the fulfillment of that. That he came as the light of life and he brought light into the darkness. And how he proclaimed that we would be the light of the world because he would live in us and his light through us, him living in us, would allow us to be the light of the world. Declaring a new mission for our life, that we would be messengers of the gospel. And then in verse 3 it goes on and it said this, you have enlarged the nation and increased its joy. When the Messiah would come, it would not just be for the Jewish people, it would also be for the Gentiles and the nation of God would be enlarged, which would increase the nation's joy. The people have rejoiced before you, just as one who rejoices in harvest time. When the harvest is coming in, the nation will be rejoicing. Pastor Charlie reminded me this morning that today is the third week of Advent. And the candle that's lit on the third week of Advent is about joy. That the joy of the world has come. Amen? Amen. And so today I want to talk to you about how an announcement can bring great joy to your life. How a mandate can bring great joy to your life. Wherever and whenever there is a revealing of the Messiah, it results in joy. In this prophetic scripture that the Messiah would come as a child, he would be the wonderful counselor, mighty God, eternal Father, Prince of Peace. I mean, come on, let's just take a joy break right now. Yeah, come on, somebody. Come on, take a joy break. Hallelujah. Yes. It's good news that he would be a wonderful counselor, an everlasting father, mighty God, prince of peace. That's really good news. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, that's on page 689 for some of you. 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 3. We're going to read a few scriptures here, a few verses here. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. It says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because of his great mercy. How many are thankful of the mercy of God? Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's good news. Because of his mercy, he came and gave you an opportunity to be born again. He came to give you new birth. That you have an opportunity for the old slate to be washed away and to become new. How many are thankful that that day that you entered into salvation and you became new? Come on, that's great joy, right? Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. See, the hope that we have that's different than the world is that we have living hope. It's not just hope that is dependent on some circumstance that can be washed away in a moment's notice. We have living hope that resides within us. That's good news. Why? Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And then verse 4, and not just that, a living hope, but into an inheritance. You have an inheritance. The new birth has given you an inheritance. An inheritance that is imperishable. It can't be taken away from you undefiled and unfading, and it's kept in heaven for you. Eternity is placed in your heart. This is all bonus material for what I'm getting to. (laughs) Verse 5, you are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You're being guarded by God's power. You rejoice in this, even now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials, so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which though perishable is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. 
Though not seeing him now, you believe in him, and you rejoice with with inexpressible and glorious joy. You rejoice because of this thing, this seed that was planted in you of the new birth and the living hope that's within you, the, the inheritance that's been given to you through salvation. That's why the Messiah would come. All these things have been given to you, and because of that, you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy. Why? Because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That's why. Verse 10, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that would come to you searched and carefully investigated. They inquired into what time or what circumstances the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating when he testified in advance to the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. In other words, the prophets, these Old Testament prophecies about Jesus, about the Messiah, that they would testify of him, of his birth, and of his death. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you. These things have now been announced. Say announced. They've been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. I mean, how many of you are thankful that somebody came and preached the gospel to you and the Holy Spirit gave the revelation of Jesus and you became born again? Good news, right? That's great news. That's great news that the Old Testament prophecies were there and the prophets were there and then it came and it was announced to you through the preaching of the gospel, but it wasn't just the preaching of the gospel, it was actually the revelation of the Holy Spirit. And listen to this last verse, and then it says, angels long to catch a glimpse of these things. The angels long to catch a glimpse of the Holy Spirit revealing the gospel in your heart. Angels are looking and longing to see the Holy Spirit activate the truth of God in your life. When all of a sudden you you positioned yourself and the Holy Spirit activated in your life, the angels are looking at that. Some interesting things about angels who are around the throne and in the presence and and they're waiting and, and in the fulfillment of the Messiah, we see angels making visitations and announcements throughout the Christmas story. Last week we read about Zechariah, who was the father of John, not the Baptist, but John the Messenger. messenger. All right, two of you got it from last week. John the Messenger. John the Messenger, John the Baptist. And Zechariah had an angel, Gabriel, visited him. Powerful announcement. Turn to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, and it was prophesied that John would be a messenger making a way For the Messiah, Luke chapter 1, that's on page 583. Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and the angel came to her and said, Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. But she was deeply troubled by this statement. Wondering what kind of greeting could this be? Then the angel told her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus, which means the Lord saves. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. And Mary asked the angel, how can this be since I have, not had, I have not had sexual relations with a man? And the angel replied to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And consider your relative Elizabeth, even she has conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for, who, for her who was called childless, for nothing will be impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, said Mary. May it be done to me according to your word. And then the angel left her. Gabriel, the angel, comes and visits Mary, makes this announcement to her. Listen, she might not have had a choice in the process. The Holy Spirit was going to come and give her a child. But there is a place where she came into agreement with the announcement. She, this announcement was made to her. This angel came and visited her, and she had to get to the place where she agreed with it. And she said, may it be done to me 
according to your word. She came into agreement with the word that was delivered to her. And then she followed that up. She took it a step further. It was a a mandate that was given to her that a child would come immaculately who would be the son of God, the Messiah. And she knew the word enough to know what the Messiah meant, that he was coming to save the people, that Jesus saves. And in verse 46, she went on and she responded with praise. She said, my soul praises the greatness of the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior because he has looked with favor on the humble condition of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed because the mighty one has done great things for me and his name is is holy the mighty one you think about mary so this announcement is made and in that announcement first of all she comes into agreement with the announcement and she said may it be done according to your word but she didn't just stop there she went on with announcement and then she began to give god praise now think about it sometimes when an announcement is given change is coming that might be difficult first of all mary how did you get pregnant you're not married yet difficult to answer right She could have had all the but gods, but God, what are all the people going to think? But God, how many people are going to think I'm crazy? But God, in the big long list, she could have got into a place of argument with God and wondering, and how is this all going to work? Instead, she entered into a place of praise. She said, God, this is your word, this is what you said, and now I'm going to give you praise for it. I'm not going to try to figure it out. I'm not going to try to get all the solutions. So many times the word of God comes to us and we try to figure it out. We think we got to do it all. And God says, no, listen, I'm going to do it. Just partner with me. And she had to partner with the word that came, the announcement. And with that word that came, she partnered with it. And then she gave God praise. She gave God praise. Turn to Matthew chapter 1. A couple pages to your left. Matthew chapter 1. Starting in verse 18. The birth of Jesus came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. (laughs) I love that. It was discovered that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. (laughs) So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her in secret. I don't know what's going on here. I don't know if you're telling me the truth. What do you mean the Holy Spirit made you pregnant? Come on, just tell me the truth. You're with another man. I'm just going to divorce you secretly. We're not even married yet, but I'm going to divorce you. I'm going to cut off our engagement. Verse 20, but after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. There's only one person that can save you from their sins. This was the days of the temple. Joseph knew it. Like every day, people are bringing sacrifices. Every day, we're slaughtering lambs. Every day, there's this bloody mess. It's the only way that we could be forgiven. But he knew that there would be one day a Messiah would come where their sins would be washed away. And now this angel is saying, listen, this is he. Now all this took place, verse 22, to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel. So Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, which is translated, God is with us. God came to be with us. Verse 24, when Joseph woke up, He did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but did not have sexual relation with her until she gave birth to a son, and he named him, Joseph named him, Jesus. You're going to be Jesus. Joseph knew you are going to be the Messiah. He didn't take it into his own hands. Joseph received the announcement. The woman he is engaged to, he hadn't had sex with her. Because that's the way it's supposed to go, that you would wait until you're married, no matter how much pressure there is, no matter what the world's telling you about it. The angel told him that the child would save his people from their sins. No one can do this, only the Messiah that we've been praying for. Joseph had a choice. 
of how he would respond to the word. How would he respond? Me, what? Me, why are you choosing me to do this, God? Why me? You really want me to do this? You want me to step into this place? I, I don't even know if I can bear the weight of all of that. But you want me to respond to this? And he made the decision to do what the angel had commanded. He married Mary, yet did not have sex with her until she gave birth to Jesus. He married her. He took her in and said, you're going to be mine. And he was obedient to the word. Sometimes the word, we have to come into agreement with the announcement that's been made. With the word. We have to come into agreement with the word. Mary came into agreement with the word with her voice when she said, be it to me. She said, have it done. Have it your way, God. She came into agreement with the word. Joseph came into the agreement with his word by his actions. He did what the word said. He went and married her even though there was going to be all kinds of ridicule. All kinds of concern, all kinds of, you guys have blown it. He went and married her. His action was obedient to the word. Flip back to Luke chapter 2. One more angelic visitation. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. In the same region... Shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the city of David, a Savior was born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. No messing around here. Let me tell you straight up who it is. Here's this angelic visitation, the glory of angels that are there, the glory of God. Straight up, I'm going to tell you, a Savior's been born. He is the Messiah. He's the Lord. Verse 12, this will be the sign for you. And I'm, I'm going to show you how, I'm going to prove this to you. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. There was no, no babies in a manger. What in the world? That was never heard of. Still isn't. Like, you're going to find a baby lying in a manger in the city of David. Suddenly, there was a multitude of the heavenly hosts with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people. And when the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to, known to us. They hurried off and found both Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And after seeing them, they reported the message they were told about this child and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary was treasuring up all these things in her heart and meditating on them. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had seen and heard, which were just as they had been told. Here's these heavenly announcements that brought great joy. Mary has this announcement. And she said, may it be done to me according to your word. Joseph had this announcement that came. And he spoke with actions and married Mary. And then the shepherds, they said, hey, let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made, no, made known to us. They didn't just lollygag around. They didn't debate about it. They didn't say, hey, what do you guys think? Should we go to Bethlehem? Should we sleep on it? The word of the, God, the, word of the Lord came. Should we sleep on it? Let's wait till the morning. Maybe, maybe we had some bad pizza tonight. Maybe that really wasn't the glory of God. They started convincing themselves that's not what it was. They could have waited, and then you know what? It could have been a week later, like, well, I don't know if we should go see this baby or not. No, immediately. They went straight to Bethlehem. They responded to the announcement immediately. The angels made these announcements. But Jesus said he would leave us the Holy Spirit who would lead us. You know, the Holy Spirit is speaking to us, making announcements about God, about us. Words from heaven for us. Here's my question for you today. When a heavenly announcement is made, what will you say? When a heavenly announcement is made over your life, what will you say? What will you do? There's many times when God spoke to my heart and I unfortunately ignored the word. There's many times where he spoke to my heart and I was scared of the word. I didn't do anything. There's many times where God spoke to my heart and I came into agreement with the word. And I found great joy. 
Because when you come into agreement with the word, you find joy. When God speaks, a mandate is given. Mary was given a mandate that she would carry the Messiah. Joseph was given a mandate to marry Mary. The shepherds were given a mandate. And they each, they each had a chance to respond to the mandate. I wonder who else was visited by an angel. I wonder who else that night, the night Jesus came and throughout the Christmas story, I wonder who else was visited by an angel, was given a mandate, and didn't respond. I mean, who else was supposed to be part of the Christmas story? But since they didn't respond to the word, we have no record of their visitation. What if there was a farmer who was visited by the angels? He was given a messianic description, and he just shrugged it off. Because he was too busy to respond to the word, and he just stayed in the field. What if there was a businessman who was visited by an angel and told of the impending Messiah, yet he wasn't willing to leave his business practices to embrace the word of God? What if there was a neighbor just down the street in Bethlehem who was visited by an angel and saw the star, but they were just too scared, too concerned about their own family, of what people might think to respond to the word. I wonder who's missing in the Christmas story. We might say, listen, God is sovereign. We have it all. We have it all. Maybe we do. We might. But God gives us a choice of whether we respond to his word or not. We have this great gift called free will. I wonder if some people had a visitation they didn't respond to. God very well might have planned for many more to respond to the announcement. Some might have just disregarded the word, or they might have thought, I'll get to the word later and forgot about it. We don't know the answer. But what I do know is that I personally have missed things God intended for me. The Holy Spirit made an announcement to me, yet out of my busyness, my fear, my personal priorities, I missed those purposes. I disregarded the word. I didn't rejoice over the announcement, the mandate that was given to me, and I missed it. Thankfully, God, he's a forgiving God. And many times, he simply gave me another opportunity, or he gave me new opportunity. What about you? What have you done with the word that's spoken to you. What have you done with it? Acts chapter 9, we see another visitation. Acts chapter 9, verses 10 through 19. It says, there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, here I am, Lord, he replied. Get up and go to the street called Straight. For the Lord said to him, to the house of Judas, and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, since he is praying there. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and placing his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. This is not a little task. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard from many people about this man, how much harm he has done for your saints in Jerusalem, and he has authority here from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. Ananias was argumentative with the word. You ever been argumentative with the word that God gave you? But God, wait, wait a minute, what, what about the people? What are people going to think? What's going to happen to me? I could be arrested. But the Lord said to him, go, for this man is my chosen instrument to take my name to Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Ananias went and entered the house. He placed his hands on him and said, Brother Saul... The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road you were traveling, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. At once, something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. After taking some food, he regained his strength. Ananias, he probably was thinking, you want me to go talk to the man who's in town to arrest believers? Like me? But even when it looks like obedience could result in trouble, God calls us to trust and obey. He is usually up to something much bigger than we realize. 
God used a faithful, though frightened, a faithful disciple to launch Saul into a sudden new direction in life. A menace was about to become a missionary. If you know someone whom you think could never be converted, don't forget what the grace and mercy of God accomplished in the life of a wicked man named Saul. Does the Lord speak to you? Have you developed any confidence in the word of the Lord for your life? He speaks first and foremost. The first place he's going to speak to you is out of his written word. It's where he's going to speak to you. But if you don't spend any time in this word, you won't allow his voice to develop in your life. When he'll begin to speak things, it's almost like the words come off the page. And he'll speak them to you and they just mean something deep to you. And all of a sudden it adjusts the course of your life. But listen, if you don't spend time there and you don't value it, and here's the other thing, if you don't value the authority of the word of God in your life, that this is your authority. The greatest authority in your life as a believer is the word. Like, it's the authority. Not what you read on the internet, not what, you, not what the culture's telling you, not all the lies that the devil's telling you, but this is the authority of the word. There's a place where you have to settle it in your heart, where you say, I'm going to receive the fullness of the word, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to let my f- flesh try to convince me about portions of scripture that I should just ignore and not live according to. The Holy Spirit's trying to help you live according to the Word. The first place He's going to speak to you is out of His written Word. It's the first place. Another place He's going to speak to you is through other believers, through His people. We gather, partly because in Hebrews it says, don't neglect the gathering of the saints. Why not? Because when we gather, there's an encouragement. There's presence, there's, there's iron sharpened iron, and there's power that's released when we gather. And when you gather with another believer, not just on Sunday mornings, but listen, if you go all week and you don't talk to another believer from Sunday to Sunday, you're going to be discouraged. You need to have another believer you're talking to throughout the week. Because you're just going to be in the middle of a conversation and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit's going to, boom, light something up inside of you and you're going to go, oh, that's for me. That's what I needed to hear. Oh, you're speaking to me today, God. And He'll speak to you in that way. And then... He'll also speak to you through the Holy Spirit directly to you. Sometimes it's in his presence where my attention has been given to him. And sometimes he'll speak while I'm watching something. I'm watching some random thing and he'll begin to speak to me. Or maybe I'm attending an event. I could be, at a, I could be in a gym at the ball game and God begin to speak to me. I could be simply driving my car down the road. The point is this, developing the ability to cut the clutter of other voices, to cut the clutter of other voices so that his voice is the loudest voice in my spirit. What's the loudest voice in your spirit? And this is a day-to-day thing. I could go go one day and not let the Holy Spirit be the loudest voice in my my spirit that day. It could be the voice of criticism, the voice of the world, the voice of the media, the voice of the culture, the lies of the enemy, could all be the loudest voice. What helps the Holy Spirit stay the loudest voice in my life is this is his word, the announcement that's been given to me, his voice, when his voice becomes the loudest voice, all the other ones begin to quiet down and you can hear clearly of what he's saying to you. And so here's the question, when he speaks, what do I do with it? What do I do with it when he speaks? What will I say? Mary said, may it be according to your word. What will I do? Joseph went and married Mary. When he speaks, what will I do with it when he speaks? There was a time I was, uh, I I went to uh, the Alamo Bowl, back when Nebraska went to bowl games. I went to the Alamo Bowl, and uh, we beat Michigan in San Antonio. I was there with a couple friends of mine, and uh, we were driving back. And I remember uh, stopping at the Love's gas stop on the north side of Oklahoma City, and uh, we stopped to get gas, and I went in to get a few things, and, and um, I hadn't spent all the cash I brought with me on that trip, which was miracle number one. And uh, I remember, you know, buying some snacks, and, and um, 
I, I remembered I had this $50 bill in my pocket. And I walked out of the doors, and there was this car right here, and there was this, it, this, this family looked to be in disarray. They looked hopeless. They just, it just didn't look good. And I remember walking back to my car over by the gas pump, and the Holy Spirit saying, give them that $50. No. <laughs> give them that $50. I don't think so. Wait, really? That's not you, God. But I could, I could use this later for some other things this week. I know I didn't spend it all. And I remember getting him in the car, closing the door, and the Holy Spirit gets it, just kept saying, give them that money. Finally, got out of the car, walked back over to where they were at, knocked on their window. They rolled it down. I said, hey, I don't know what's going on right now, but you just look like you're in a tough spot. And I got to my car, and the Holy Spirit told me to give you this money. It's not much, but hopefully it can help you. I want to pray for you and just bless them with a really short prayer. And just said, God bless you. And as I walked back to my car, you know what I had? I didn't have sorrow from giving money away. What I had was great joy because I was obedient to the word. Great joy comes from being obedient. I've been sharing, uh, I've shared a few times about uh, this the waiting for the fulfillment of the word. So I, I've shared about how I, I, I hit a deer and totaled my van Good Friday. And the Lord said, wait till October, which I thought that meant wait till October to buy a car. He said, no, wait till October because you're going to need to spend that money on something else. And I'm still waiting for the fulfillment. And that can be difficult, right? It can be difficult to wait on the fulfillment and just to be obedient. Because I could go take it into my own hands and just go get a car. And probably get myself in a mess. Not counting all the cost, right? Because my flesh wants a car. But I'm trying to be obedient to the word, and waiting for the fulfillment can be hard. There was a time a few years ago when we had uh, the Big Igloo Freedom Fest here on the 4th of July, where we had this uh, big party on the yard and had fireworks and all kinds of great stuff, right? And um, it was uh, about year four or five of doing that. And uh, we're preparing for thousands of people on the property and, and working and doing all kinds of things. And, um, you know, I shouldn't be doing anything else in the middle of that time, but the Lord said, go look at this car for my son. I'm like, I'm a little busy. The Holy Spirit said, go look at this car. So I go to this car lot, and there was a car that was a cheaper, reasonable car, didn't cost a lot of money for one of my teenage sons um, that he needed. And I went, I took it for a test drive, and I thought, wow, it's a pretty, pretty decent car, it's pretty reasonable. And, um, you know, I think we... We didn't, have, we didn't have the cash then, but I thought, okay, we could probably, we could manage this. It's just a few thousand dollars. We'll get it paid off pretty quickly. I got out of that car, and I was taking a few steps across the lot, and I noticed another car right here. This was a nicer car, and I thought, and the Holy Spirit said, drive that car. I'm like, this is the kind of car my son needs, not this kind of car. And he says, no, but your wife needs a car. So I got in that car, I took it for a test drive, it was a great car. Great car, lasts us for a long time. And um, got back in the parking lot and I thought, man, I, those are two good cars. And they're both, uh, all right. I don't know how we're going to do this, God, but I guess we're going to do it. And I got out of that car and I was walking across the lot and then I see this truck. <laughs> it's getting a little crazy, right? I take this truck for a drive and I come back and I, I just can't let go of these things. They're just like here. I mean, I know years ago when we went to go get a minivan and we, we sat in the seat. I hadn't even turned the ignition on and I knew that was the van. I knew. This is it. See, when you spend years of letting the word be the authority of your life and you spend years learning how to discern the voice of God, the farther you get along in life, it becomes a little more prevalent. I wouldn't say easy. A little more prevalent of knowing so this crazy deal, two days before the Big Igloo Freedom Fest, I bought three cars. <laughs> and I got home that night, I thought, what in the world? It just like happened, just like. <laughs> and I went into debt to buy these three cars, which is, you know, opposite of all the stuff we preach in a lot of ways. God will allow you to go in debt if he knows he can trust you. We don't tell people to go in debt very often because most people can't be trusted. I got, I got home that night, and I, I said, Lord, why, why in the world did I buy three cars today? 
This is what he said in my heart, because that guy needed to sell three cars today. Nobody else was listening. I needed somebody to go buy three cars. All right, God, these are your cars. <laughs> We're trusting you. And, uh, and they have all have been a blessing for a lot of ways. Come on up, Abby. What will you do with the word that has been delivered? Now listen, I could stand up here and te tell testimonies all day of being obedient to the word, and that's not like, oh, good job, Mitch, because I want to tell you how many times I missed it because I was afraid, because I couldn't figure it out how it was going to work, because I thought I needed to fulfill it on my own. Give you a laundry list of reasons of why I didn't respond to the word. I wonder how many things I missed. You don't got to worry about what you've missed. It's about what are you going to do now? Jesus says, if you're a believer, if you've entered into the new birth, he says, my sheep hear my voice. So get rid of that lie right now. Some of you in the room that believe the lie, God doesn't speak to me. I just rebuke that lie off your life right now. It has no authority over you. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. The best counselor in the world is the one he gave us, the Holy Spirit. And he wants to speak to you. You've got to get rid of the clutter. You've got to let his word be the authority in your life. One more scripture, Luke chapter 6. Jesus just finished preaching the Sermon on the Mount and sharing a few other things. And then he shares this story. Luke 6, verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say? We could have just, go back to our banjo, we could just read that verse and went home. <laughs> Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say. He's saying things. And, and I want to help you. I'm not here to condemn you. I want to help you. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say? Verse 47, I will show you what someone is like who comes to me, hears my word, and acts on them. Here's an acts. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. When the flood came, the river crashed against that house and it couldn't shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears and doesn't act is like a man who built his house on the ground without a foundation. The river crashed against it and immediately it collapsed. And the destruction of that house was great. Jesus is the rock. Here God says, listen, Jesus is saying, listen, those of you who hear the word and they act on the word it's like building your house upon the rock you won't be shaken listen floods and storms are going to come to all of us believers and unbelievers storms are going to come but if you're built on the rock you can stand but if you build on the sand you're going to be washed away quickly he says come build your house on the rock of my word on the rock i am the word of life build your life on me i've got things to say to you respond to what i'm saying I've got good intentions for you. I'm here to bless you and not harm you. My words are life to you. They're good to you. And I want to exhort you today, the Holy Spirit is going to give you a mandate in the days to come. He's going to give you a word in the days to come. He's going to deposit something in your heart, and you're going to have this choice. What am I going to do with the word that's been given? Am I going to say, yes, Lord, let it be done, and I'm going to give you praise. I don't know how it's going to be done, but I'm going to give you praise, and then I'm going to partner with the Word. I'm going to begin to walk it out of my life. Or is He going to give you a mandate, and you're going to say, I don't know how that's going to work. I can't figure it out, and I'm just not going to be obedient to it. And you're going to miss the blessing and the story that He has for you. It's not about where you've been and what you've done. Uh, don't worry about all that. But what are you doing today with the word that's going to come? How do you get the word that God has for you? For some of you, it's simply a word of how to lead your family. For some of you, it's a word about changes to make in your life. For some of you, it's a word of how to be a blessing for somebody else. There is a word. There is a mandate that is coming and there is something God is asking us to step into in 2024. I can't wait to share it with you. But he wants you not to be powerless, but to be powerful. 
He wants you to not be weak, but to be strong. He wants you not to be distressed, but to have peace. He wants you not to live in discouragement, but in encouragement. He's got hope for you. He is the living hope. And we have living hope because we have been born again. And Jesus not only died for our sins, but he beat death, hell, and the grave. And he rose again. And he has given us an inheritance that is undefiled. And it is kept for you. There are plans and purposes for you. It comes through the obedience of the word. Come on, let's stand. I had a conversation. Had a conversation with a Jewish person a while back. Someone who grew up in synagogue. And I said, so all those years, what were you doing? What have you been doing? And he said, waiting for the Messiah. Waiting for the Messiah. I said, absolutely. And I began to share some Old Testament scriptures prophetic scriptures about Jesus, like the one we just read in Isaiah 9, like the one we read in Isaiah 7. Began to read prophetic scriptures about Jesus. Like, these, this is what the Messiah is going to do, right? And they would say yes. This is what the Messiah is going to do, and they would say yes. This is what the Messiah is going to do, and they'd say yes. And then I began to share with them, because they didn't know anything about Jesus. All they've been told is, ah, I don't listen about that stuff. So he's told all of his life. I said, listen, what, what if Jesus, listen, this is what Jesus fulfilled. He fulfills that scripture here. He fulfills that scripture here. He fulfills that scripture here. I said, what if he is the Messiah? What if he is? What if he is the one you've been looking for? What are you going to do with Jesus? I got that question for you today. Maybe you're watching online. I have that question for you today. What are you going to do with Jesus if he is the Messiah? If he is the Prince of Peace, the Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, if he is... If Jesus is, which I would tell you he is because that's my experience. I found life when I found Jesus. What are you going to do with Jesus? He doesn't want you to punch a religious clock. He doesn't want you, he, he wants you to be part of him. And you do that through surrender. Through surrender, not just adding him to your life. Jesus, just come and be part of my life. No, that doesn't work. Because then you, you just say, Jesus, your voice matters the same as everybody else's voice. But when you're fully surrendered to him, Jesus, I surrender everything to you, and I want your voice to be the loudest voice in my life. When you get to that place, you lay it all down. Jesus, come into my life and save me. I believe that you died for me. Save me today. When you pray that prayer, transformation comes in. And what Peter said, we read in 1 Peter, that you would experience new birth, and you would experience living hope. That would be the testimony of many in this room. Let's pray. Father, I pray today, Lord, if there's any among us who do not know you as Messiah, who do not know you as Savior, if that's you right now, I want you to say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I believe that you are the Messiah. I believe that you died for my sins. Forgive me today. I believe that you are the resurrection and the life. I surrender to you today. I surrender, Jesus. Save me. Save me save me. Make me new. I want to be born again today. I want to have a living hope. I want to be a new man, a new woman. I want to experience you today in a new way. Jesus, right now, would you come into my life? Would you become the loudest voice in my life? Would every other voice bow to you in Jesus' name? Father, I pray right now for the rest of us in this room. God, I pray for those who have been believers, Lord, that we've allowed things to happen in our life and other voices have gotten loud. I pray right now, Jesus, that you would speak loud. Lord, that you would give a mandate, that you would make an announcement. Holy Spirit, would you make an announcement over our life that we can partner with, Lord, that we'd be able to say yes to, we'd be able to put action to it, we'd give you praise for it, we'd respond immediately, we wouldn't hesitate. We ask you today, God, we ask you right now, Jesus, we are your sheep. Your word says that we hear your voice. We ask you today, God, you begin speaking in our hearts. You begin giving us a mandate about those things that, you're called, that you are calling us to do. God, we want to partner with you and your word today, that you would speak your word over our life. Would you come and deposit your word in our hearts, God? Father, I repent today. Lord, I, I, I repent today, Lord, for the times that I haven't allowed your word to be the ultimate authority in my life. God, I want to allow your word to be the ultimate authority in my life in everything that I do. And right now, I just want to take authority over the voice of the accuser. 
that has told you that you've messed up, you've done things, that you can't hear the voice of God, I just, I just break that off you right now in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, lying voice, go right now. In Jesus' name. The voice of the accuser be broken off of you right now that's told you that you can't hear the voice of God. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come and begin to speak. Holy Spirit, come and be comforter. Holy Spirit, be helper. Holy Spirit, be advocator. Holy Spirit, do what you do here on this earth for each and every one of us. We give you honor and we give you praise. We celebrate you today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Come on, give God praise for his word today. Come on now, sing this out. Make a declaration today. Make a declaration. Sing this out. Come on, build your life upon him. Today, God, we just declare again that we place our trust in you. We place our trust in you, God. Father, I thank you that you are, you have, you have deposited living hope within us. We ask you, God, that that living hope would lead us this week. God, that your voice would speak to us, Lord, that we would hear the announcement made from heaven. Lord, that we'd be able to respond with great joy, with great joy, inexpressible and glorious joy. We rejoice, God, in advance. We rejoice, God, because you're going to be speaking in these weeks as we finish out this year. You're going to begin speaking to us already about things for this next year, God, about opportunities for new things. God, we honor you and we love you. We celebrate your goodness today, God. We honor you, God. Father, as we leave this place today, would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear? Help us, Lord, to be an extension of your love, Lord, to those that we come in contact with, Lord, today and throughout this week as people are scrambling and got the spirit of religion and Christmas on them. God, Lord, help us to be life. Help us to be life in the midst of all of that. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Be blessed. Listen, if you, uh, if you need prayer today, the people are coming down right now, they're going to come down to pray. We'd love to pray with you this week. If you need prayer, you need prayer about anything, we have people who are going to pray with you. If I don't see you next week because you're going to be gone, we just want to tell you Merry Christmas. And um, next Sunday, we will have our regular 9 and 11 services. I've got a word for that. And then uh, Pastor Ron has a word for our Christmas Eve service. It'll be a different service on Christmas Eve at 6 o'clock. Be blessed. Have a great 